Canberra recently held a pretty cool retro event, namely the Canberra Vintage Computer Exhibition. This was organised by some locals in conjunction with the Australian Computer Museum Society. The first event was held last year but somehow flew under the radar for me. This time however I headed on down to Radford College and got down there pretty early. And I found a huge diverse range of retro computing history. The exhibition was neatly organised to go roughly forward in time from the entrance. So let's dive in. Upon entry, there was some gear from way before my time that included a front panel of a General Electric 225 mainframe. This was introduced in 1958, primarily for scientific and engineering applications. The attendant of this machine told me it was saved after being found on a metal recycling scrapyard. This unit was of note because one of its successors, the GE 235, was used to write the programming language BASIC on, way back in 1964. And next to the GE 225, we come across a teletype running ELIZA. I'd only ever read about this program before, but here I am using it. It was developed in the 1960s at MIT, and it was made to simulate a conversation with a human based on pattern matching to generate responses. It's significant because it contributed to the field of AI by demonstrating the potential of natural language processing based on templates. Now I've got to say, I don't know much about the era of punch cards and paper tape, but they had some machines up and running, reading instructions. Here's a working Heathkit H11. My understanding is, the H11 was sold as a kit microcomputer in the late 70s. It was a cheaper alternative to DEC's PDP-11, on which its architecture is based. Next up, there were some PDP variations. Someone was trying to boot a random hard drive on this micro PDP-11 variation. I was told they had a whole bunch of these hard drives in storage, and brought some along to try and see what was on there. Pretty exciting computer archaeology thinking that this stuff hasn't been read in probably close to 40 years. On the table next door there are bits of computing history including some core memory, storage mediums and part of the mainframe computer Ciliac which was built in Sydney in the 1950s. A machine built to serve the School of Physics, it was based on the design of the Iliac computer out of the University of Illinois and would have roughly been the size of a small room. Now the rare and quirky local stuff, that is, computers designed or sold in Australia. First up, we can't go past the Microbees. Microbee was an Australian company that was around from the late 70s to the early 1990s. They started by selling kit computers, but eventually the demand saw them sell them pre-built commercially. An early version was the Microbee 16K 32K, which were primarily marketed towards the education sector and was eventually widely used in Australian schools and universities during the 1980s. Now how about this for the travelling businessman? I've never actually heard of this, but it's an Amos Executive 816. A quick Google doesn't actually find much information about the company, but thankfully there are some specs and info next to the unit on display. A computer in a Samsonite briefcase. It ran CPM and could run off a car battery. This is actually quite innovative, but that price tag looks monstrous. And right next door, there are some Dick Smith machines. For those that don't know, Dick Smith was an Australian entrepreneur, aviator and philanthropist. But the part that's relevant here is there used to be a chain of stores called Dick Smith Electronics that were successful in the 70s, 80s and 90s. They targeted the electronics hobbyist and average tech consumerist. Here we see the Dick Smith System 80 which was essentially a Tandy TRS-80 clone. Moving along, we come across a Commodore PET. I probably don't need to say much about Commodore. If you don't know, they were basically really big in the 80s and actually still hold the record for the most successful home computer ever sold. That's not this unit here. This is an early precursor, I guess you could say. I've never actually used one, so here I am playing Breakout. We next jump the pond from the US to the UK. Here's my first time seeing an Amstrad CPC-464 in person. That's one long computer. I've heard about Amstrad because as a kid, I'd loiter at a computer store that had an Amstrad Mega PC on display. If you don't know, those machines were basically a 386 or 486 computer paired with a Sega Mega Drive. Yeah, that's right, you could slot the Sega cartridges right into the front of the PC. That blew my mind as a kid. Amstrad did some unique things. This machine here is a portable desktop called the PPC640. I actually almost bought one of these recently. I just love the super 80s vibe of them. It looks like a prop from an 80s action movie. These things were super portable at only 6 kilograms, and they do run DOS, so you can run old school 80s DOS games on them. And you can't really talk about UK computing without the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. 
This is my first time seeing them in person. Never even used one. But basically, these were really popular in the UK as they made computing affordable to the average punter. There's a few on show from the early ZX80 to the later Spectrum Plus. I've got to say, those keyboards on those early machines are pretty iffy. Now, an interesting detour down the road of telephony. Here is a display showing off a telecom computer phone. Telecom was the national Australian telephone provider, now privatised as Telstra. The computer phone is a clone of a British system from ICL slash Sinclair, and it basically acted as a telephone, PC, terminal, and answering machine. The nifty part about the answering machine was it had computerised vocab software, so you could set up a British Stephen Hawking sounding customised automated message response to would-be callers. But an even more interesting function of this unit was its ability to connect to Telecom's other futuristic offering called Viatel. Viatel was a video text service launched in 1985. It was a way to access graphical pages about news, weather and financial data. You could also use it with a TV connected to a telephone line. I actually remember using later versions on TV, which was accessible via free-to-air channel on television on supported TV sets. I remember the zany colours and graphics of Teletext in the early 90s. I can only imagine how futuristic it must have felt in the mid-80s. A fun fact about video slash Teletext was that it was broadcast in the vertical blanking interval between image frames. What this means is, if you happen to have a VHS home recording of some TV program channel from the 80s or 90s, you should be able to pull the Teletext from the VHS and display the Teletext page. This is something the owner of this machine was actively pursuing and is currently working to archive a bunch of lost video text slash teletext pages. This machine here was able to actually dial into an emulated server hosting some historic pages. Pretty cool. They had a corner set up to demo some live soldering skills, which also happened to be live streamed. A pretty cool concept and the demo was happy to take questions. Pretty cool for anyone looking to repair or restore their systems. And I did happen to spot a Nabu on the shelf in the background. Man, those things have really travelled to all corners of the earth lately. Next door to that was a bunch of Ataris, like this Falcon 30, a unit priced by most Atari fans, as this should have definitely been a hit product. Released in 92, it had a 32-bit 16MHz CPU, VGA support up to 640x480, 14 meg of RAM, 16-bit audio, and also supported MIDI. And next up we have this CompuMate. Released in 1983, this was a peripheral add-on for the Atari 2600 VCS, turning the console into a computer that could run BASIC. It had a lot of limitations, but it's great to see one in person, including the box. I then came across this Atari 400, 800, 800XL and ST. This is computing history right here. The 400 and 800 were launched on the back of the 2600-VCS to compete directly with the Apple II and TRS-80 and were significant milestones in home computing for Atari in the late 70s and early 80s. This later model 4160 ST was released in 1988 and had some pretty impressive GUI software. One table over, the Radio Shack TRS-80 and Tandy 1000 the 1000 was an inexpensive PC compatible with an Intel 8088 CPU running DOS. It wasn't the first PC clone, but based on sales data was initially the most successful and really opened the door for other manufacturers who saw the success Tandy were having. Now whilst I was over near this section, I was hearing a distant grinding noise that sounded oddly familiar, and upon getting closer it was actually a dot matrix printer. TRS-80 was set up and its owner was graciously letting people use some banner software on it to print out their own banners. Just like you were readying yourself for a party in the mid-1980s. I of course had to give it a go. This brings back memories of using Printmaster Plus back in the late 80s to create all sorts of banners, cards and posters. Needless to say, it took a while to print mine. Three hours later. Finally onto the IBM and PC clones. I don't actually know what this portable unit is, so let me know in the comments below if you do. Directly next to that, someone had a mint looking IBM 5150 I believe. 
This is running a breakout clone. I'm still tossing up whether I want this or the Apple IIe more. And then I came across a section which is probably most familiar to me. Early to mid 90s PCs. This here was a nice example of a PC Pentium 166 and it was running a super underrated DOS game called Jill of the Jungle. I of course couldn't pass this up and had to stop and play. And of course, you can't show off a PC without running Doom. This is running on a rather nice looking compact unit with inbuilt speakers. Next there was a Mac section with quite a diverse selection of products. One of the Macintoshes was running Prince of Persia and I just had to have a solid go of that. In between the newer and older Apples was also a Laserdisc setup. Because why not? And then, a computer that probably brings the most nostalgia for me. I was lucky enough to attend a public school that just happened to get a bunch of these in the 80s. I remember they basically kept them in a vault. We did have a PC clone at home, but at school we had Apple IIe's, and more importantly, we had a teacher that would run us through how to use them properly. I simply loved playing Moon Patrol and Oregon Trail on the IIe back in the day. Here I am playing it for the first time since those 80s school lessons. And finally it was on to the Commodores and Amigas. They had a VIC-20, PLUS4, 116, various 64s in different case variations with a bunch of peripherals. I've never owned a Commodore, but various friends had them back in the day and I remember playing Ghostbusters and being blown away by the sound effects. I also distinctly remember how quirky they felt to use with their custom keyboard layouts as by that time I'd become used to PC clones and the Apple IIe. I must admit I actually know nothing about Amigas as I've already mentioned we had a PC clone at home. Here's me playing Monkey Island. But anyway, after a friend was raving about them I did some googling and it's actually quite amazing what these machines could do back in the day. In hindsight, it's actually kind of shocking that they didn't win the computer wars, as the machines were way ahead of their counterparts in the late 80s. I guess Commodore was pushing their products in too many different directions. And that about wraps up the Canberra Vintage Computer Exhibition 2023. I wasn't really prepared to do much recording for this event, as there were some interesting demos and conversations had that would have been really nice to record. But it was a big success and all signs point to it being run next year. I think I need to get a plan together to attend and hopefully display some of my own stuff. We shall see. Anyway, thanks for watching guys and catch us next time.